Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we're going to be continuing our look at uh, beam deflection and slope, or finding beam deflection and slope by integration. Uh, more specifically, the double integration of the moment function, which itself is derived by the double integration of your load function. So we're going to explore how uh, to find, or and look at a simple example of finding um, uh, the deflection of a beam under load, and then we're going to continue on with a discussion in depth about uh, how to find boundary conditions, the potential boundary conditions at both pin, roller, and fixed supports. And finally, we're going to see how we can apply uh, the end values of different pieces of a piecewise uh, load function or piecewise. Uh, rotation, uh, slope, or deflection equation uh, to find the uh, starting values of the uh, next piece of a piecewise function for deflection or uh, slope. In a, or in other words, how we can apply beam continuity to be used as our boundary conditions for the uh, analysis of beam deflection by integration. Uh, today we're going to be uh, continuing our look at beam deflection by integration, by the double integration method. And uh, as we developed last time, again, we're looking at beam deflection by integration today. And as we saw last time, uh, we developed a few formulas relating the uh, moment functions of curves or, or of beams uh, to um, the deflection of beams. So uh, there's a few things we can look at. So uh, if you have load function W, so for, let's just review briefly, uh, for a load function W, Uh, for load, load function W as a, a function of X, for a W as a function of X, uh, we know from prior work that shear is just going to be equal to the negative integral of the uh, distributed load as a function of X. Uh, we, of course, know that moment is just the integral of shear or at least the moment between two points is equal to the integral of shear, or the change in moment between two points is equal to the integral of the shear function. And then, uh, as we saw last time, this can be extended to uh, uh, find beam slope and rotation, or sorry, beam slope and deflection. So we can say that, uh, that theta, which is the slope of our beam at some point, is simply equal to uh, 1 over EI times the integral of moment as a function of x, oh, and dx integral, of course. And finally, we can say that uh, that theta, or not theta, that delta, or uh, let's see, yeah, uh, or you can use y, the deflection of the of a beam at a certain location is simply equal to the integral of theta as a function of x. So the integral of theta of x dx, or that is equal to the double integral with respect to x of our moment function um, over ei, of course. Um, dx dx and moment as a function of x. And again, this, uh, these relationships come directly out of mechanics. They come directly from uh, simple applications of Hooke's laws and, or Hooke's law, and also assuming a small uh, angular change, small deflection, etc. So that is what we developed last time. And today, I want to look at a few examples and uh, look at some of the intricacies and subtleties of working with um, of working with the, the uh, uh, slope and deflection formulas. So I thought we would start with the simplest beam. Well, I suppose the simplest beam would be a beam with no load at all, um, but that's a little too boring. So instead, we're going to look, uh, first of all, at a simply supported beam with a uniform load. So let's say we have a simply supported beam with a uniform load, and there is a distributed load W across it. And we'll give this thing a length L. Uh, so we have a simply supported beam of length L. Uh, by simple equilibrium, we can see that the reactions at each side, uh, the reactions, of course, will just be WL over 2. 
and WL over 2. No great surprise there, basic statics. Okay, so uh, I want to, what I want to do, oh, and I should also say that the beam has a uh, modulus of elasticity E and a moment of inertia I. So what I want to do is I want to use these equations to develop the equation of uh, uh, for the maximum deflection of a beam at midspan, of a simply supported beam at midspan. So let's use this. Uh, find, let's say find the maximum deflection in the beam in terms of the provided variables. Uh, the max deflection of the beam. So first of all, we can say that W, our distributed load as a function of x, well, because this is a just nice uniform uh, constant load across a simply supported beam, we know that our, uh, that our distributed load is going to be equal to W. And then um, we can say that uh, shear is equal to the integral of this, or more specifically, the negative integral of this is equal to uh, the negative integral of w of x dx, which in this case is just equal to our constant w, uh, negative uh, w of x, or just the integral of w dx, and that is then equal to, uh, that is going to be equal to negative w x, and plus a constant of integration, let's call that c1. Now, uh, integration rules, standard integration rules do apply when working through these. So when we're working through all of these, so with each of these, we will have to worry about uh, constants of integration. So uh, the integral of uh, w of x um, is going to be, uh, is of course, just negative w of x plus c1. Now, we need a boundary condition. And as we might recall from our studies of shear and bending moment previously in the term, we would expect the shear diagram to look something like this, with a, uh, with a positive shear at x equals 0 equal to WL over 2. So a boundary condition I can use for my shear is that, uh, that the shear at, del uh, that x equal at x equals 0 must be equal to WL over 2. So my boundary condition is that v at x equals 0 will be equal to wl over 2. Uh, so we can go then substitute that in, and uh, we can find fairly simply that c1 must equal wl over 2. So that means that, uh, that shear as a function of x is equal to uh, negative wx uh, plus wl over 2. Uh, no great surprise there, and we can confirm that this checks out by saying, okay, well, at x equals 0, that means we will have a value of a shear of wl over 2. When we put in x equals l, that will give a, a shear of negative WL over 2, which is exactly what we would expect for our uh, shear function. So uh, next, I want to work through, uh, we'll, go, we'll go into moment, continuing this down the road. And of course, moment's just going to be equal to the direct integral of shear with appropriate boundary conditions. Because like with any integration, we need to keep in mind our boundary conditions as we go. And so uh, moment then as a function of x, our moment as a function of x is just equal to the shear as the integral of shear as a function of x, the integral of v of x dx, and uh, again, our shear is equal to WL over 2 minus WX. 
uh, integrated with respect to dx. Then we can say that uh, we can get the integral here. And then let's see, just applying some standard polynomial integration, we will get that our uh, integral is wL times x over 2 minus, uh, let's see, wx squared over 2. And then uh, plus a constant of integration. And I'll just call that c2. OK, now we do need a boundary condition here to get our c2. And to do that is I'm going to realize that at we, because we have pin supports on either end, our moment is going to have, must come to zero at both ends. So our boundary condition, our boundary condition will be, uh, let's see, I know that the moment at x equals zero will simply equal zero. And so it, when I have the moment of x is equal to this, my wlx over 2 minus wx squared over 2, I can see very easily that uh, that our uh, c2 is going to be simply equal to 0. So therefore, moment as a function of x is equal to wlx over 2 minus wx squared over 2. And we can check, we can confirm this by putting in a couple of values. Uh, let's see, if I put in x equals 0, I indeed find that my moment is equal to 0. If I put in um, x equals L, what will I have? Well, I'll have WL squared over 2. Um, let's see, if I put in x equals L, yeah, WL squared over 2 and WL squared over 2. Yep, so that is correct. We'll have w, If I put in x equals L, I'll have WL squared over 2 here minus WL squared over 2 here, and I will indeed end up with 0. And if I put in um, x equals L over 2, basically I'm just check, doing some checks of my work as I go. WL times L over 2 minus over 2 minus W times L over 2 quantity squared divided by 2. And this whole thing will come to WL squared over 8, WL squared over 4. And indeed, I will just get WL squared over 8, which is exactly what I would expect for my um, standard uh, moment formula uh, for the maximum moment of a simply supported beam which occurs at mid-span. So we have our moment function. Now we can move on to our, uh, our new integrations, the new levels of integration that we, looked, that we started looking at last time. And that's where uh, we'll start looking at the slope of the beam and the, uh, the slope of the beam, and uh, then its deflection. Okay, so uh, we have our moment function, which is right here, our wlx over 2 minus wx squared over 2. So next I want to move on to getting the slope function. And remember, theta is our slope, our dy dx. Uh, theta as a function of x is going to be equal to 1 over ei. Uh, let's see, 1 over ei uh, times... Uh, our moment function here, well, times the integral of our moment function here, which is wlx over 2 minus wx squared over 2. And, of course, integrated with respect to x. Okay, wlx over 2, wx squared over 2, uh, we are good. Okay, so then let's apply that, in that integral, 1 over ei, Oh, let's see, some lovely polynomial integration in the morning. So uh, we will have 1 over ei times, uh, that will be w l x squared over 4. And then we should have uh, w uh, x to the third over 6. 
I believe. That looks good. And a uh, plus a C4, or sorry, a C3. Okay, so we have that. Now, um, I might, if, if I could, I would like to get a uh, my constant of integration. Unfortunately for this beam, as this is a simply supported beam, I don't really have boundary conditions that I can use for the slope because I know the beam is going to, to start and end at the, at the start and end points. I have a moment like that, deflection like this, but I don't, ha so I know that the deflection at the left and the right end is going to be zero. However, I have no idea uh, what the actual angle or the actual slope of the beam is at either end or at the center. Well, actually I could apply that, you know, I suppose I could say that the slope of the beam has to equal zero at the center, but I would rather not do that because that would only be, that will only be true for a, a symmetric beam. So I'm going to leave this as C3 and actually use a, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave this as C3 for now and actually find my um, constant integration C3 in the next step. Okay, and again, I'm doing this because um, my boundary conditions, I know that the deflection is zero at both ends of the beam, but I don't know anything about the rotation of the beam uh, at, at its various ends, at its two end supports. So uh, I'm going to move straight on to finding the deflection function. So uh, y, our deflection, as a function of x, uh, let's see, that will be equal to the integral of theta as a function of x. In other words, equal to the integral of our, uh, our slope as a function of x. And so that's 1 over ei times the integral of our function here wlx squared over 4 minus wx to the third over 6 plus c3 dx. All right, applying this integral. So 1 over ei, 1 over an ei times, let's see, so that is going to be wlx to the third over 12. Uh, divided by 12 minus uh, wx to the fourth divided by 24 uh, plus c3 times x and then plus some constant of integration c4. Okay, so I'm going to use some boundary conditions. Uh, so I have two constants of integration, that means I need two boundary conditions, or I have two unknowns, and that means I uh, need two boundary conditions. And thankfully I do have two boundary conditions related to the deflection of the beam as a function of x. First of all, I know that the deflection at x equals zero is going to be zero. So boundary condition y at x equals zero must be equal to zero. So if I put in zeros for all my x's and zero for this, so zero, one over ei uh, times, well, that's just going to be zero minus zero plus zero plus c4, I can conclude that c4 is equal to zero. So our constant of integration here just drops away. And we'll finish this up over here. So we almost have our full deflection function. Just need to plug in one remaining boundary condition, and that is that the deflection at x equals L, where x is equal to the uh, beam length, or in other words, we're looking at the point at the far right side of the beam, their deflection will also be equal to zero. All right, so uh, let's see, we have, again, at this stage, we are at y as a function of x is equal to 1 over ei 
Uh, times, let's see, we have WLX to the third over 12. Uh, minus WX to the fourth over 24. And uh, plus C3 times X. And our C4 term has dropped away. Like so. Okay, so WX to the fourth over 24 uh, and WLX to the third over 12. We are doing fine. Okay. So a boundary condition, we need another boundary condition to get C3, and that boundary condition will be that uh, deflection Y at X equals L will also be equal to zero. So I'll put in um, zero here, equals one over EI times, let's see, WL times L to the third over 12, minus uh, WL to the fourth over 24 plus C3, uh, and that will be times L. And the one over EI will uh, bounce away like that. Uh, let's see, so then we're left with, uh, let's see, that's going to be, both of these will be WL to the fourth term, so I'm gonna make this two WL to the fourth over 24 minus WL to the fourth over 24. Uh, plus C3 times L. And this of course equals zero. And this will then be equal to, let's see, if I subtract this, this will be uh, simply WL to the fourth over 24 and then plus C3 times L. Uh, and this, of course, oh, yep, and this equals zero then. And let's see, cancel out an L, that will become a third. And uh, so then C3 should equal negative WL to the third, negative WL to the third over 24, if I manage to math that correctly. So, therefore, uh, deflection as a function of x will be equal to uh, our final function then, the, uh, y is a function of x. Oh, let's see, that will be uh, w uh, l to the third divided by 12, oh, one over ei, times w l to the third over 12 minus, oh, sorry, that should be w l x to the third over 12, manage it. No, I'm just gonna rewrite this whole thing. This got a little misaligned. Okay, so y as a function of x is going to be equal to one over ei times uh, wl x to the four or uh, x to the third divided by twelve minus w x to the fourth over twenty four and then uh, minus our constant of integration. W L to the third uh, divided by 24. And that is our overall uh, deflection function. Assuming I mathed that correctly and made no errors, which you never know can sometimes happen. Uh, uh huh. Yep. Oh, oh, yes, thank you. And hey, I mentioned math errors. There you go, there's a math error. Yes, there should be an X on that term. Thank you. I was just seeing if you were paying attention. That's what that was. Sure, we'll go with that. All right, so we have our deflection function. Again, assuming no other math errors. And now we can go and uh, find what the problem was asking for. And that is our uh, deflection, our maximum deflection, which will be at mid-span. 
Now, if we wanted to prove that the maximum deflection is at midspan, uh, we could go back to our theta function, our deflection, or our uh, our slope function, Beca and basically by we, we can apply a little bit of calculus to figure out where any local maxima will occur by saying, okay, well, the uh, since um, since slope is the uh, since since deflection is the integral of slope, that means that slope is the derivative of deflection. And so therefore, wherever the deflect wherever the slope is equal to zero, you must that's where the uh, wherever the wherever the slope of the beam is equal to zero, that's where your deflection will have a local maximum or a local minimum. So if you wanted to find that, we could set the we could set the theta of x uh, equation equal to zero. Uh, find where that it, find what x values that's true at, and then uh, we would know that's where local maxima or local minima is. However, for a simply supported beam, we know the maximum deflection is going to occur at midspan, so we can just directly use this equation and uh, we can just directly use this equation and calculate the uh, deflection at midspan. So we have y as a function of x. Again, is one over e i times uh, WL uh, x to the third over 12 minus WX to the fourth over 24 and minus WL x to the uh, WL to the third X over 24 uh, WL to the third X over 24. And uh, our midspan coordinate, uh, our midspan x coordinate, will of course be l over two. So y of l over two. Let's see. We'll still have our one over e i. And let's see. So that is going to be w l. Uh, that is going to be x to the or not x l. L to the third over 8 over 12 because uh, if I put in x over 2 it, or put in l over 2 for x minus w times uh, that is for l over 2 to the fourth power will be l over 16 over 24 and then we'll just have uh, w l uh, l to the fourth again but then um, over, uh, let's see, that's going to be L over 2, so that'll be over 48. All right, so we have that, and we can keep chugging along. So let's see, 12 over 8, that will be 96, I believe. Uh, yeah, 96. So WL to the 4th over 96 minus, oh, that should be a L to the 4th there. So uh, 16 times 24, uh, let's see, that is going to be, oh, my brain is not warmed up today yet, so 16 over 4, 16 times 24, that comes to 384. So that will be uh, WL to the 4th over 384. 384 and then minus WL to the fourth over 48. And I could do some similar fractions, but I think I'll just go ahead and let my calculator do the hard work because I am incredibly lazy, if I am anything. Um, let's see, let's do that. Let's just go and do a common function, one over 96 minus one over 384 and minus one over 48. And uh, unsurprisingly, one over 96 minus one over 384 uh, minus one over 48, I get uh, one over EI times uh, negative five over 384, negative five over 384 uh, WL to the fourth. Or alternately, our y max, which is that mid span, is just uh, negative 5 wl to the fourth over 384 ei. 
And that is the standard solution that you'll find in any beam table. And if we had the actual uh, moment of inertia and the modulus elasticity, we could calculate that fairly easily. Although we would have to, of course, take uh, special care uh, when you are doing these type of types of calculations with actual numbers, uh, make sure you take care to use consistent units because by default length is usually, if you're using English units, uh, length is usually in feet, W is usually in like something like hips per foot or pounds per foot, while E is in KSI, uh, force per square inch, kips per square inch, inches to the fourth, etc. So make sure you use uh, compatible units. Okay, so uh, let's review the process here. Um, again, as a review, the process that we took was we started with our uh, our load function. We first integrated that by applying a uh, the negative integral. We uh, we we applied the negative integral of uh, the the load function to get the shear function. And then we applied a boundary condition um, produced from a simple free body diagram about uh, what the, uh, to find the first constant of integration. For, uh, then we moved on to the moment. To get the moment, we integrated it and applied the boundary condition that uh, at each end of the simply supported beam, our uh, moment would be zero. Then we integrated it further and applied and divided by one over, and, divide, and divided by one over EI uh, to get our uh, slope function, our theta as a function of x, and that was uh, uh, pr that did produce a constant integration that we couldn't solve for immediately. That was our C3, and we couldn't solve for that because we didn't know anything about the slope at either end of the beam. Finally, we applied a uh, one final level of integration. We integrated our slope to get our deflection, and we applied a couple boundary conditions um, and those boundary conditions were knowing that at each end of the beam, the, uh, the deflection must be equal to zero at the pin and roller supports, pin and roller supports uh, respectively. Okay, so any questions on this problem? Okay, so hopefully that one's fairly straightforward. Again, that's, uh, this is just a, probably the simplest beam you can work with. Um, so they only get more complex from here, uh, unfortunately. So now that I've illustrated the process, I want to talk a bit in detail about uh, potential boundary conditions, uh, various things we can use, various boundary conditions we can use to find our constants of integration. This is an integration method, so we know that um, every time we integrate something, say with respect to x, we're always going to end up with constants of integration. Uh, you know, sometimes in shorthand, I'll say that deflection is equal to the, in the twice integral of moment, but that's not actually true. It's really that the, the double integral of moment is really the change in uh, deflection between two points, not the actual deflection at some point. To know the actual deflection at some point, you have to apply, um, you have to apply some known boundary conditions uh, to then get your, um, uh, unknown constants of integration because again every time you integrate with respect to x you are going to inevitably uh, create unknowns um, which then need to be solved through boundary conditions. The bane of every introductory calculus students the dreaded plus c. And no it does not go away. So again, next we're going to talk a bit about potential boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions are going to come right out of our, um, really right out of our support conditions. Okay. So let's talk about potential boundary conditions for uh, beam deflection analysis by integration. So potential boundary conditions. So 
So uh, the first set is going to come out, uh, just come straight out of our um, supports, and specifically supports at the end of beams. So pin slash roller support. And these will apply whether you're looking at a pin or a roller support. So let's say you have a pin support. And additionally, maybe the beam is horizontal. And after some load is applied to it, it's going to undergo some rotation and end up at some uh, rotation deflected at the end, at its end like this, so with some slope uh, theta. Well, what do we know at the pin, at a pin or roller support? Well, we know that uh, by definition, a pin uh, or roller support, uh, for example, a pin support will be able to resist motion in the X and Y direction, and a roller support will be able to resist motion in the Y direction, perpendicular to the surface. And since now, and the only thing that matters for deflection is the, uh, at least for most beam deflection, is the vertical distance because deflection is usually defined as perpendicular to the beam rather than along the axis of the beam. So um, what I know at a pin support is that Y equals zero. At the location of the pin support, by, defini by the very definition of a pin support um, or a roller support, I will have no vertical uh, deflection of the beam at that location. So that means anytime I have a pin or roller support, I know the deflection is going to be uh, absolutely just right at zero at that location. Also, oh, but we can then look at uh, theta. So theta, however, uh, with pin or roller support, the only thing that the pin support constrains is the vertical motion. We don't know anything about the rotation. Um, by definition, at a pin roller support, that support is not providing any resistance to rotation. It's not providing any moment capacity. So if the beam wants to rotate, that support will just freely let it rotate. So um, what we can say is that the theta is n equal to zero, or at least we have no information about the theta at that location. So if we have a pin or roller support, we know that at, lo at that location, the vertical deflection will be zero. However, we don't know anything about the rotation. All right, so that's our first potential uh, boundary condition. Then we also have, uh, along with pin supports, we have fixed supports. Uh, we have fixed supports. And this is probably, you can probably see where this is going, hopefully. But we have our beam and it will want to undergo some rotation theta, but it actually won't be able to. Instead, it will end up doing this kind of behavior because right at the pit, uh, at the roller support, not the roller support, the fixed support, not only is our deflection y equal to zero, our theta, our slope is also equal to zero. So by definition, a, uh, a fixed support or a moment support, a fixed support by definition has a high moment capacity relative to the beam. And so when I try to rotate this, um, not only is, uh, is the, and when I try to apply a downward force to this, not uh, to this beam, not only is the support going to prevent it from move, moving left or right, but it's actually also going to fix that angle of rotation. So if this is at a right angle, for example, um, before or after, that, that right angle will remain. So again, for a fixed support, a fixed support has high moment capacity relative to the beam, so it is able to resist both translation and rotation. So at any fixed support, we have a built-in boundary condition, and that is that our, uh, both our deflection and our slope at that location must be equal to zero. Okay, so that's some potential boundary conditions. And next I want to look at what happens if you have one of these interior to a beam. Okay, so what happens if you have a longer beam? Something like, oh, I don't know, something like this. What if you have a continuous beam? Oh, something kind of like this. and you apply some sort of load to it, 
And uh, if you apply some sort of load to this, well, let's say, for example, we apply a load like this to it, to this beam. Well, how is this going to behave? Well, it's going to deflect like so. Our, um, the, the, uh, I have two bays, a loaded bay and an unloaded bay. The loaded bay is going to go into positive curvature and the unloaded bay will go into negative curvature, so positive bending and negative bending. Now, um, why does it form this particular shape? Well, um, a beam, if it, uh, this support here, this pin support, is going to fix the vertical uh, motion of the beam, the vertical translation of the beam, but because it's a roller support, it's not going to do anything to uh, resist rotation. So the beam will be free, uh, as long as it remains pinned at that location, it will be free to move, it won't be able to move left or right or up or down, but it will be free to move, uh, it will be free to rotate about, if I, I could call this point A, B, and C. So uh, I could even use, I could even use these interior locations as a potential boundary condition. So I could say that uh, Y at A is equal to zero, Y at B is equal to zero, and Y at C is equal to zero. So no great surprise there. Um, so again, if I have a, a pin support here, I can say that uh, because the pin support restrains the vertical motion of the beam at B, I know by default, uh, without even doing any calculations, that the deflection at B has to be equal to zero. And so from these supports, I could then have three potential boundary conditions. Uh, even though, uh, but then of course in turn, I would know nothing about the rotation at these points and I would have to do uh, further calculations. I would have to look at the uh, deflection calculation in order to find any constants of integration that come with our, uh, that arise uh, from our third integration step as we did in the previous problem. Oh, is not equal to zero, not equal to zero, not equal to zero. Again, we know because they're pin or roller support, at a pin or roller support, we know that the deflection is going to be equal to zero, but we don't know anything about the rotation at those particular points. Okay, so questions so far on boundary conditions. Okay. So I'd like to look at a uh, third and final potential source of boundary conditions, and that is the beam equations themselves. And this is going to arise because we, uh, when doing beam analysis, it is usually a perfectly, it is usually a valid and necessary assumption to assume that beams are continuous. And let's see what I mean by that. Let's discuss this. So, uh, consider the shear and moment function. Uh, v and M functions don't have to be continuous. Uh, v and M functions are not necessarily continuous. If you have just a, uh, if you have a, a single, uh, you know, continuous load distribution and no other loads on the beam, then yes, moment and shear will be continuous. However, we can have uh, shear diagrams that are uh, something like this, where you have a, for example, if you had, let's say you had a continuous uh, or uniform load across a beam and a point load in the middle. If that were the case, your shear diagram might look something like this, where you have the shear gradually dropping from the, uh, from the uniform load, and then a sudden drop at the midspan for say a, from, say, a point load that was somewhere um, in the middle, that was at midspan. And the same thing can happen uh, with moment. You can have a jump or a drop in the moment if you have a point moment or couple applied at some location in a beam. So you can absolutely have, oh, something like this, and then something, 
Well, you can have ultimately any shape. You can have uh, jumps in the moment diagram if there are any couples that are present. Um, however, let's consider how this would look for an actual beam. Can you have jumps in the rotation or in the uh, or in the uh, uh, in the slope or in the deflection? And so let's look at uh, rotation, or in other words, the slope. So can you have jumps in the slope? Well, let's think about what this would look like for an actual beam. If you had a beam with a jump and slope, it would have to look something like this. You would have to have a location where the slope of the beam itself suddenly changed. Something like that. And I don't know about you, if, you know, if you have your flange, this is, this is, you're looking at a, uh, you're looking here at, say, a W section, a wide flange shape in um, elevation view. And so you have your flanges, your flanges, and your web. And so if you were to have a sudden change in the slope of the beam, then you would actually literally have to have the beam basically kinked um, at a certain location. And uh, this is generally not a good thing. So, um, generally, you're not going to have any changes in your slope. So generally, theta of x should be continuous. You shouldn't, the slope can change. In other words, if you have a beam like this, however, the slope should change continuously. The slope should be a smooth curve all the way through the beam, um, varying with the different loads that are applied to it. So theta of x uh, should be continuous. Generally, there's gonna, there's, there will be one exception. And the only exception to that is the moment release. The internal pin or the moment release. In other words, say you have a beam. Well, this beam here wouldn't even be stable, but let's ignore that for now. Or we could say something like this, where it's a fixed support there. That would be stable. At this location, you can have a sudden uh, jump in the uh, a sudden jump or drop in the slope of the beam simply because you have a pin there and that is able to uh, allow motion of one piece with respect to the other. Okay, so unless you but if unless you have a uh, a moment release or an internal pin in a beam, you should expect the the slope to be a continuous curve all the way along the length of the beam. And then finally, what about deflection? What about deflection? Well, here there really aren't going to be any exceptions, not even at a, 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 a moment release, because think about what this would look like. If the deflection is going to be, uh, is going to undergo a jump, well, that basically means your beam is now fractured, because you'd have to have something like this, where there was actually a sudden drop in the actual neutral axis of the beam. So you have a neutral axis here, and then you have a neutral axis here. And the only way that's going to happen is if there is a, you know, sudden shearing of the beam. And at that point, your beam has literally broken in half. So uh, that can't really happen. So even though your moment and shear have to be continuous functions, your deflection really doesn't. Or other way around, sorry. <laughs> even though your uh, moment and shear can be discontinuous functions, your deflection absolutely has to be a continuous function, and your rotation generally will be, unless you have the one exception, which is the moment release. And so, uh, and why this is important is that you can use this knowledge as a, uh, as a source of potential boundary conditions. So let's see what I mean, let's see what I mean, uh, let's see what I mean by this really quickly. So, 
Uh, let's say I have a beam that's something like this. Let's say I have a beam with uh, discontinuous loads on it. Uh, and just like we had when we looked at uh, moment and shear, anytime you have a discontinuity in the load, uh, that means you're going to need some, uh, you're going to have some discontinuity in the load function, which means discontinuities in all the functions that are based on that. So that includes, um, so that, so you're going, so, so let's say you had something like this with points A, B, C, and D. Well, you would have a, uh, you would need a shear function for each of these. So shear would be equal to some piecewise function of uh, shear. One thing from, you know, x is greater than a to less than b, one from b to c, etc. Uh, etc. And because you're applying this by integration, because these functions are based on each other, that will percolate down all the way to the level of the deflection as a function of x. So this will also be a uh, three-piece piecewise function, um, again, from A to B to C, so A, B, B, C, and C, D. And the reason I mentioned these deflections and uh, continuity of rotation and deflection is that you, uh, because this is continuous, you are able to use the end values of one piece as the boundary condition for another. So in other words, if you find this first, you could you might find this first piece, the, all the constants of integration based on of this first piece, based on the knowledge that um, uh, based on a support, say like a say that you know the deflection at the left end is zero, so you might find the uh, you might find the deflection at that location uh, or all the constants all the constants of integration for this interval here. Develop the full equations for deflection. Then you could put in x equals b uh, into this first piece and find both your rotation and deflection of the beam at that point and say those and the, the uh, basically the values of your uh, deflection and rotation of this interval at point b should also be the same as those values of that interval at point b for the middle interval. So just like we did in moment, um, but uh, in moment, there it can actually it, there can actually be exceptions for like a, a point couple, etc. But uh, for deflection, especially, there will be no exceptions. Your deflection should always be a continuous equation unless your beam is breaking in half. And so your um, you can use the end values of one piece of a piecewise uh, defle uh, deflection function as the starting boundary values of the next piece. And that's how you can apply continuity. Uh, arguments based on continuity to find the constants of integration for slope and deflection. Okay, so I know that was a lot. Um, any questions on anything we have covered today? All right, that'll do it for today. Again, today we looked at, uh, first we just applied a simple example of uh, double integration of the moment curve to find the uh, rotation and deflection of a uniformly loaded simply supported beam and finding the maximum deflection at the center. Uh, then finally, uh, we continued on to look at some potential sources of uh, boundary conditions to find constants of integration, uh, namely finding the uh, boundary conditions that exist at both uh, pin and roller and then fixed supports. Finally, we discussed how to apply beam continuity to find our, uh, to uh, serve as a source of potential boundary conditions for more complex beams that have multiple zones of analysis in a larger piecewise function. All right, so that was a lot. Uh, hopefully you found this informative. Hopefully you found this maybe a little bit enjoyable, depending on your uh, definition of enjoyable. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy, etc. Um, if you have any questions, again, feel free to leave them below. Uh, regardless, I hope to look. I hope to see you all soon. Uh, we'll be looking in the next lecture, uh, finishing up uh, some look at beam deflection by integration. Maybe working through a little bit more complex example. But uh, regardless, that'll do for today. So I look forward to seeing y'all in the next lecture. Look forward to seeing y'all then. And as always, thank you.